Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Canyon Hills. Come on in and find a seat. Uh, if you are new with us today, we always like to just start the day by saying a quick welcome. We'd ask that while you're here, you grab one of those white cards you see in the pocket of the seat in front of you. Uh, we just want to get to know you a little bit better. And if you fill that out, we'll make sure someone gets a hold of you and hopefully makes this visit as personal uh, as we can make it. So if you just drop that in the offering bucket a little bit later in the service, uh, we would very much appreciate it. Uh, as you came in today, you probably noticed all the volunteers we have out in the parking lot. Uh, the parking lot ministry is underway and going really well. Um, we still need help though. So if you are sitting here today and you still do not have a place you are serving or you have some more service that you'd like to apply, we really need your help. We need like 50 more volunteers out there in the parking lot. So if you're sitting here thinking, um, you know, I'm not really doing anything, this is a great place to start. Please, uh, you can sign up. I think you can do it online. You can find out more information in your bulletin. So just take a look. We'd love uh, to get your help in that area. I uh, we'll also want to say a quick happy Father's Day. Are there any fathers in the room? Would you just raise your hands? <laughs> happy Father's Day to all of you. We're glad that you're here. Um, today is an interesting uh, Father's Day in the Orr House. As some of you um, probably know and some of you don't, uh, we are expecting our third child currently. Um, it's, it's exciting, yes. Um, <laughs> My wife's about 23 weeks, and about two weeks ago, we went in for our first ultrasound just to make sure everything was going fine. And um, the lady put the little wand on her belly and immediately looks up at us and says, is this your guys' first ultrasound? Um, and so we immediately got a little bit nervous and said, yes. Uh, and she said, do you have any idea what I'm looking at right here? And she put this picture up on the screen. Uh, now, a lot more of you are much quicker than I am, because I looked at that and just thought, that looks like a dude in a gas mask. I have no idea what I'm looking at right now. And she said, no, that would be two heads. So, um, and they're separate bodies, which is also good. Um, <laughs> so, so there's that. Be praying for us. Dallas is convinced that she, this means she owns one. So that's, you know, if you know anything about my daughter, we should be praying. And so uh, anyway, we're excited. Be praying for us. That's all I've got. Now they're completely derailed the service. Why don't you guys stand up, turn around, shake some hands, find a dad and wish them a happy Father's Day.
sin and darkness Whose love is mighty and so much stronger The King of glory, the King above all kings Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder And leaves us breathless in awe and wonder The King of glory King of all kings Come on, we all sing This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You lay down your for all that you have done for us and all that you continue to do. Lord, we are so thankful for the grace that you've shown us that has granted us peace with you for all of eternity. But uh, God, we are also thankful for the grace that you show us each and every day. The grace to make it through each and every trial, each and every struggle. Lord, there's so much hope in the knowledge that you were there with us. 
So we praise you for that truth in Christ's name. Amen. Come on, sing this with us. Be still, there is a healer. His love is deeper than the sea. His mercy is unfailing. His arms a fortress for the weak. Let faith arise. Let faith arise. I lift my hands to leave again. You are my refuge. You are my strength. As I pour out my heart, these things I remember. You will fail. up and never runs out on us 
And one of the ways we get to see that on full display is in baptism. So I'm gonna ask you just to have a seat and uh, we wanna share with you just a few stories of lives that have been changed by the amazing love of our God. Take a look at the screens. Hi, my name is Kevin Choker. I've been coming to Canyon Hills for just about three years now with my family. Uh, my wife's name is Corey and I have two kids, uh, a four-year-old named Mason and a six-year-old named Sophia. I came to Christ at a very young age. I grew up in a Christian home, uh, went to a Christian school all the way through high school and even college. Um, went to church every Sunday with my family. And so being a Christian is all I've ever known. But uh, when I reflect back on my life, I think the time where I really took ownership of my faith and really made a decision that I wanted to follow, follow Jesus with my life was when I was in college and had to make those choices for myself and my parents weren't there to get me out of bed on Sunday morning and go to church or you know, hold me accountable to the things I did in my life. So college, I think, is a time when I really took ownership of my faith and could move forward and know that I wanted to trust Him with my life. Christ continually changes me because I've, I've had to learn to trust in Him um, no matter what life throws at me. He's been there for me and He continues to be there for me. And yet sometimes I, I still need to be reminded that when I'm facing a challenge, when there's something going on that I can't handle on my own, I can trust in Him. So um, as I've grown, I've, I've learned that no matter what life throws at me, God's bigger and can handle it and can get me through any challenge that I'm facing. I'm getting baptized today because I want to take that step of obedience to what I believe Scripture is telling us we should be doing. Um, in the membership class, Pastor Steve talked a lot about the the biblical foundation for why we baptize by immersion in this church and it made a lot of sense to me so I want to take that step of obedience. I was baptized as an infant in the church that I grew up in and then when I was in junior high I made a public profession of my faith in front of my church and this next step for me is really about being obedient to what I believe scripture says about baptism by immersion. Good morning church. I'm Pastor Steve Hill, and it is my great privilege to uh, be able to baptize a couple of people this morning. Uh, this, first of all, this is Kevin, as you just heard his uh, testimony and his great desire to follow Jesus Christ with all of his life. Kevin, I know what we uh, just uh, witnessed as we heard your, your testimony, but could you uh, just tell us very briefly again, why are you coming to be baptized? Um, you know, as I said in the video, I, I just feel like it's a step of obedience. Um, We've been coming to this church for a bit now and, and really love what, what we are um, experiencing as a part of this church. And we, I want to just be fully, fully involved in the life of church and involving being a member and, and being baptized. Kevin, so. let me ask you, uh, do you love the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart? I do, yes. <laughs> Woo, good. <laughs> Is it your heart's desire to follow him in obedience the rest of your life? Yes. Then based on your profession of faith, I want to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Nathan, say hi to everybody. Hi. Nathan, how old are you? 11. 11 years old. And uh, you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. uh, how, did, how old were you when you accepted him as your Savior and Lord? Four or five. And who helped you to do that? My mom. Your mom. All right. Let's give mom a big hand there, I'll tell you. <laughs> and is your dad a big part of your life as well? Mm -hmm. And where's your dad? All right, good, good, just to be sure. So his dad, Doug, is here as well. Let me ask you, uh, do you desire to love the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart, soul, and mind? Yes. And are you willing to follow him and do whatever he asks you to do? Yes. All right, then it's by your profession of faith that I baptize you along with your dad 
In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. My name is Alicia Asher, and I've been coming to Canyon Hills for about a year and a half. Surrendering my heart to the Lord has been a definite process. Um, about 10 years ago is when I gave my heart to the Lord, and then about five years ago was kind of when it became um, a bigger issue in my heart. Jesus has been the saving grace of um, my marriage and just my um, identity. Uh, he has made me who I am. and that I am so thankful for. Without him, my life would be completely uh, different. And I am, I am so thankful for his love and his grace. A big change in my life since giving my heart to Jesus is just the way I live, I live my life. 10 years ago, I did a lot of um, partying and different things and um, that, that changed, but also just the way I love my friends and my family and um, just, I think it's made me a better wife. Um, I think it's helped me just have more compassion and there's still a lot of work left to do. And um, I'm just uh, a work in progress. I'm by no means even done and that's a wonderful thing that I get to continue learning. I'm getting baptized today because I want to um, obey the Lord and uh, He's called me, He's put on my heart to serve the church in a ministry and this is the last step in obedience so I can further um, serve the church and um, that is why I'm getting baptized today. Awesome. Awesome. Well, good morning, church. My name is Pastor Jeff. I'm one of the pastors here, and we've got Alicia here, as you saw up on the screen. And I think it's cool how it talks about the process and how 10 years ago she gave her heart to the Lord, but then it wasn't until five years ago that she really started living that way and, and just now kind of coming to a realization of, you know what, I need to, I, I need to make this public to everyone that I see, and, and it's just been really cool. Um, I think a lot of people have your story of just a, of, of a long process of, of coming to faith in the Lord and then, and then really making that a, a big part of their life. So um, I think we heard it on the screen, but I want you to say it in front of your family and your friends and your church, um, have you given your whole heart to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I have, definitely, 100%. Awesome, awesome. Well, then it's my honor and privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My name is Michael Johnson. I've been attending Canyon Hills off and on since I was a child. I've always known of the name of Jesus, but I've never really truly had that genuine relationship with Him. And Up until this past November, I have been really living a selfish lifestyle. I have been trying to fill a void inside of me with the pleasures of this world. I've been a drug addict for the past seven years, and along the lines of that, uh, everything that comes with it, I've really been just doing some sinful things. And so this past November, I was living with a childhood friend that I was really close with over all the years. In the morning of November 1st, we got in a conflict. He said some things to me along the lines of, it's really sad to see someone you grew up with become such an addict, become such a fiend for these things. It just really came across to me as God speaking to me that my life had really just fallen off and really just I had been not living a life that was morally right. So after that argument, I left the house and I just was driving and I pulled up to a gas station and I had just had a moment where all the sinful things I was doing just came crashing into my mind. And up until this point, I had been numb to everything that I was doing and really just not feeling guilty or remorseful for the things I have done. At this time, I just stepped out of my car and I just really had a time of prayer with God. I hadn't been praying lately. and. I just spoke to him. I didn't ask for anything other than his forgiveness and 
I truly felt guilty for the things I had been doing, the families that I had been tearing apart, families that I didn't even know, the drugs I was putting into my body, the just sinful acts that I was doing. I just asked God if He could forgive me for these things. I just didn't want to live a life like this anymore, and I just had been living for myself, and I didn't know how to do it. So the biggest change in my life hasn't been the fact that I've been clean for nine months or that I'm not living the life that I was once living, but really what I'm truly grateful for is my relationship with my Savior, Jesus Christ. And what this has done for me is instead of trying to find that peace by selfish means and by things of this world, I have really found peace by loving others and Jesus' love for me. I really learned what it means to just be a light in this world and the peace that I find from that just surpasses everything that I have done before. And I, I just can't say how amazing God's grace and His mercy is. And just truly, I am so grateful that I have a Savior in heaven that would forgive me for the sins that I have committed in my life and that is there for me every day. And I just want to be able to share that love and be a uh, solid example of Christ for whoever I come into contact with. The reason I am getting baptized today is because I just want to show everyone that I love Jesus. The Bible tells us to repent and be baptized. I truly have felt that transformation in my heart recently and I'm here today to say that I love Jesus and I want everyone to know it. cool story about how God can change someone and how God uses incredible means to, to bring about repentance and bring about change in someone's heart. And Michael is um, a graduate of the Mission House, uh, one of the programs that we support, and he got some of his friends here, and so excited to be with you. And it's been cool to see the change in Michael over the last year, um, just to see him transformed from, again, like he said in the video, a person that's living for himself to a person that's living fully for God. And, um, and I know a lot of this because he's my brother-in-law, and so <laughs> I'm really excited to be here with him. And then he's got his dad here, and the transformation for both of you guys has been huge over the last year. So, um, Mike, we heard it on the video, we heard it really in a really great way. Um, but can you just tell everyone what Jesus means to you? Have you surrendered your whole heart to Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior? I have. Jesus is just my best friend and my father and my Savior, and I'm just so happy to be in relationship with him. Yeah, amen. Well, it's a joy for me, Mike, to um, be in here with your dad and to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's really encouraging as we see stories like that. I don't know about you, but it just reminds me that the people that we love, the people that we care about, the people that are far from God, there's no heart that's too hard and no heart that's too distant. And I hope that you hear that message. It's one of the reasons why we want to share these baptism stories with each and every one of you is because I think we need to be reminded of the amazing transforming power and work of the gospel. Jesus changing hearts, changing lives for his kingdom. And so I'm just going to ask us to get to our feet. We're going to worship here in a moment, and we're kind of making this up as we go, so bear with me here. But just feel this burden. I know that there are people in this room who we know and care about people who are far from God, whether that be family members, maybe that's friends, maybe it's someone that, you know, we don't even know that well, but we know they don't know Christ. And I would hope that as a church, it would be our prayer that every one of those people would be on that screen at some point in time in their life testifying to the amazing work that's been done. So could you just take a moment, would you just lift up those names, whatever name it is that the Lord brings to your heart, can we just bring those names before God, asking him to do the work of the impossible softening of people's hearts. Ask that he would break them down and bring them to a knowledge of him. Do that now.
Father's names are being lifted up all over this room. I pray for comfort in the hearts and minds of those praying. Lord, I pray for just that gentle but firm reminder that these hearts are not too far away for you. They're not too hard for you. Lord, remind us of your strength and your power that you are the God who doesn't just do difficult things, who doesn't just do things that are easy, but you are the God who does impossible things. And so God, as we look at these hearts and it may seem impossible to us, Lord, remind us today that it is not impossible for you. And Lord, may we just trust these hearts to you, believing that you can do a mighty work in Christ's name. Come on, would you just sing these words with us in faith?
you believe that this morning, say amen. Some of you are in church today because you need to be reminded that God specializes in the impossible. And we're going to put our faith to the test this morning as we go to God in prayer and ask him for the impossible. So let me invite you to take your seats and let's just bow our heads together. As we go to God in prayer this morning, let me ask you, what's that situation in your life that seems impossible? And for some of you, something immediately came to mind, a family member or a friend who's going through a tough time or a financial issue or someone you know needs to come to Jesus or maybe it's a sin that you feel like you can't shake. Seems like we all face those impossibilities. And we're gonna ask God to move in a special way Listen to these words. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? You see, nothing is too hard for God. So whatever impossible situation you're facing this morning, let's bring it to God right now. Let's lay it at his feet and say, God, I don't know how you're going to do it, but I give it to you. Let's do that right now. As we're asking God for great things today, I'm going to ask as a church family, we just ask God to do some great things with our mission teams that are heading out this week. We have four global outreach teams heading out this week. We have a kids team going to Wenatchee. We have a middle school team going to Mexico. We have a high school team going to Ecuador. We have a young adults team going to San Diego. And I'm going to ask that we pray for these trips and pray that God's kingdom would be advanced through each trip in the hearts of each one going and in the lives of the people they're going to impact. Let's just pray for that right now. It's Father's Day, and I just want to ask that we take a minute and pray for the dads of Canyon Hills. We know biblically, dads, we are called to be the spiritual leaders of our home. We know that we set the spiritual temperature, what happens in the lives of our family. So I'm going to ask everyone in the room to pray for the dads of our church. And if you're a dad, pray for yourself specifically that God would mold you into the man of God, the husband, the dad he's called you to be. Let's pray for dads right now. Father, thanks for hearing our prayers. Thanks for the reminder that you specialize in the impossible. There's nothing you can't do. So we commit these requests to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What a privilege it is just to come to God and know that he can do anything. There's no limit to his power. We're going to continue to worship in just a minute as we give our tithes and our offerings. So you're getting ready for that. Um, Kobe mentioned at the beginning of the service these fit cards that are in your bulletin. If you could take a look at that for just a minute. If you joined us since we started the service, fit around here stands for First Impressions Team, and we have been ramping up this team for the last few months. I'm happy to say we have a couple hundred people who are serving in our fit ministry between the parking lot and ushers and greeters, um, but we still have some openings in the parking lot, and we just want to put the invita- invitation out to you um, to get involved in ministry. If you don't already have a place to serve, we could certainly use your help out there. So if you can fill this out, you notice on the card, you can write if it works to do it once a month, twice a month, three times a month, whatever works best for you. 
and then just drop it in the offering buckets as they go by, and that would be great. You know, it's not too often that we have a dad in the service that's turning 100, but we do. My buddy, Ray Barkley, I see you sitting over here. Stand up, Ray. This Tuesday, Ray turns 100. <laughs> happy Father's Day, happy birthday. Ray's one of those guys that's turning 100, going on 50. Um, I know he drove, he and his wife, to church this morning. Um, just a few years ago, they bought a new car. Who buys a new car in their 90s? I asked him, I said, how long are you gonna be driving? He said, well, probably next time I won't renew my license. I go, next time, when is that? He said, I'll be 102. So, <laughs> good for you, Ray. Happy birthday, that's awesome. I wanna invite the ushers to come right now and collect the offering, and as they do, dads, we have a special tribute for you. Take a look at the screens. Good job, Lauren. Okay, I got it. Okay, don't forget to carry the one. Okay. That was delicious, thank you. All right, hold on there, kiddo. Dad. Say cheese. Cheese. There you go. Okay, just one more. Hold your trophy up a little bit higher. Dad. Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's time to rise and shine. Dad. Love it. Um, no. Dad. Dad. And they were here first. So Dad. We... So you want to go catch a movie at like 7.30 or something? <sighs> Dad. And one more. Okay, one more. Okay, let's go. Wait, 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 come on, just one more, one more. Dad. I'm so proud of you. Now you just gotta get a job. Dad! You look beautiful. Oh, Dad. Uh, and stand just a little closer together and move just a little bit to the left, uh, my left, uh, a little more. Dad. Well, one more time, we just want to wish all the fathers in the room happy Father's Day, and uh, just pray that you feel the honor of being a dad and that you uh, sense the blessing that you are as a dad. We are excited that you're here. I personally believe Father's Day is like one of the best holidays in the history of the world, Christmas, Easter, Father's Day, in that order, Okay. And I think it's providential and, and very a, a clear indication of the sovereignty of God that Father's Day today happens to also be the longest day of the year, so we can relish in it even more together, okay? Take full advantage of that. Hey, let's get our Bibles open to 1 Peter chapter 3. We're working our way through 1 Peter. We're going to keep doing that today. Uh, we're at the halfway point in this little letter in the New Testament, so if you're new or newer, uh, what we're doing is we're going through books of the Bible on Sunday morning. We just go verse by verse, so bring your Bible if you're new. First Peter is a, is, a, is a book in the New Testament that is filled with practical insights, church, on how to live our Christian life in the midst of a culture that is hostile to Jesus. For some of you, you can relate to that maybe a little personally. It could be you, you, you feel hostility towards Jesus in your own family might be in your immediate family, maybe your extended family, but there are people you know and love that do not know and love the Jesus that you do. It might be in your own neighborhood. It could be your next door neighbor. They know you're Christians and they don't think too highly of you because you are. It might be the place you go to work every day. You might leave every day knowing that when you get there, you're gonna face some hostility towards your beliefs or even just towards you personally because you are a follower of Jesus. 
Others of you, it could be the school you go to, the classroom you're in, your prof, your teacher, your fellow students. First Peter is basically a handbook on how to live in the midst of that kind of environment, a culture that persecutes. And Peter is trying to give us some handles on how to suffer with grace, how to endure those types of things with grace. It's a trumpet call to true followers of Jesus Christ to not give up in the face of trials and persecution. That's what he's doing here. And we, we have seen and will continue to see that with genuine compassion, Peter calls us to live out our faith in a way that is divinely powerful. He's calling us to live our lives in the face of persecution and hostility towards Jesus in such a way that it will actually silence the critics of Jesus. He's calling and showing us how to live our lives in a way where we can put the goodness and the glory of God on display even brighter in the face of hostility and persecution. And finally, he is giving us ways to live out our faith in this kind of a culture that we might even have joy and peace in spite of circumstances and situations where there is no joy and peace. And that's what we want. Isn't it? That's what we want to do. We, we, want to, we want to put the goodness of God on display. We want to live with joy and peace, even in the midst of difficult times. So Peter's going to continue in that discussion. He's going to get even more specific today. Your Bibles are open to 1 Peter 3. Let's stand for the reading of his word. We left off on verse 7 last week, so we'll pick it right up in verse 8. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered by those who revile your good behavior in Christ, may they be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. God, I, I just pray that you will make these words make sense, God. They seem so contrary. God, we confess they do not seem normal or natural to us to be able to live with joy and purpose in these circumstances, God, we ask that you will give us grace today to understand. And I pray, God, for those who are standing here right now, God, you know who they are. They are hurting, they are suffering, they are hated, they are being lied about, gossiped about. I pray, God, that you will give them unbelievable hope today. Help them, God, to see the power in these words. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I titled this message, Walking with God Through Persecution. And in order to be able to do that, Peter gives us several things that we need to know, that we need to do, so that we do not abandon our faith or lose our faith or give up our faith in the face of difficult times. So there are several big principles in this passage. And underneath those big principles, there will be ways to apply them. Now, I confess, I think I might have bit off more than I can chew with this passage because I have not finished the sermon yet. I've already had two tries at it. So uh, this is the third try, and um, we're just going to go at God's pace today, and we'll stop when we run out of time or before dinner, something like that, okay? <laughs> How many of you have plans for lunch or dinner today? Anybody? Okay. All right. We'll get you out on time. The first major principle in walking with God through persecution is this, stay really close to other believers. The Bible's very clear, church, we need each other. 
Truth is, Christians always flourish in authentic community, and typically we always flounder in isolation. And Peter knows that. He knows that we're going to need each other even more when we feel the heat of persecution and hatred because of Jesus. So he gives us several reasons why we need to stay close to believers, other believers, so that we can walk with God in persecution. The first reason is we need to know what and why we believe. The first thing in his instruction list here, walking with God in persecution, is this. Finally, all of you have unity of mind. A little curious of a statement, but I can tell you what it doesn't mean. It isn't a call for us Christians to compromise our biblical morality so that we can get along with the world. He is not calling us to a blind acceptance of false gods, false religions, or false teaching. That is not the unity he is referring to. When persecution hits, what Peter knows is that we need our theology. And it has to be true. It has to be accurate. In essence, Peter is saying, be strong in your knowledge of God. And he realizes that this is a team effort. Our growth in the knowledge of God is a team effort. That's why he's calling all of us to have unity of mind. And so we come to church to hear the word of God. We go to life group to talk about the word of God and how it applies to real life. Sometimes we go to classes or seminars or sometimes we go and attend our Thing, our school of discipleship here at Canyon Hills, where we can go deeper and deeper in our knowledge of God. Peter reveals a little bit later why that is so important. I want you to turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. In my Bible, it's just one page to the right. 2 Peter chapter 1, calling us to know what we believe and why we believe it. He says in verse 3, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who has called us to His own glory and excellence. Now look at that sentence again. Peter is saying, listen, because God is supernaturally and divinely powerful, He has given to us all things, that everything we need to live this life in a godly way. To live this life in a world that is hostile towards Jesus, we can do it in a godly way, and we receive that power through our understanding and knowledge of God. And so Peter starts off his other list here in 1 Peter chapter 3, and he says, listen, in the context of suffering, in the context of persecution, you must have unity of mind. You must walk with each other growing in a true and accurate knowledge of who God is and what he is like. And that's a team effort. And so I want to encourage you. Our unity comes as we grow and learn the truth about God. And there is no greater time than we need to know the truth about God as when we are being persecuted and suffering. Secondly, He calls us to be sympathetic toward persecuted believers. Again, as he's calling us to stay really close to other believers, it's for the purpose of being sympathetic. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, have sympathy. That just intrigued me that in this list of reasons why we need to stay close to each other, one of them is so that we have sympathy with one another. For many believers around the world, church, life as a Christian is treacherous. Every single day, it is life and death when it comes to following Jesus. Now, many of us in America, by God's grace, don't experience that on any level. But for some people, and even for some people here right now in this service, there is some version of the difficulty of following Jesus in your life. As I already alluded to, it might be right in your own family. It could be that you're married to someone who hates the Jesus you love. It could be extended family. It might be where you go to work. It might be a neighbor. It could be any of those, but you understand 
how hard it is to live in the face of that. And Peter says, I want you to have sympathy for one another. Now, sympathy is different than pity. Pity is just feeling sorry and just happy that it's not us. Sympathy involves sacrifice. And so we pray for each other and we pray with each other. We give money to global outreach and missions where we're taking the gospel and God's love to people in the world who desperately need encouragement and hope. It means that we go. As we prayed for today, we have over 100 people leaving this church this week for a week or two of ministry around the world, including here in our own country. And so we show our sympathy by praying for, giving to, and even going to Christians and missionaries in the world that we partner with in order to come alongside them in a sympathetic, sacrificial way as they live in the face of persecution. We need each other, both here and around the world. Another reason he wants us to stay close together is because we need to love our Christian family. He says here, finally, I want you to have unity of mind, sympathy, and brotherly love. He reminds us to love each other like family, warts and all, right? I don't know if you've ever noticed, but, but have you ever noticed that there are some weird people in the family of God? Have you ever noticed that? There's just weird people that go to church. Am I not right? It's okay to say yes. We're all in this together, right? I don't know if you've noticed this, but have you ever noticed there are people who are really hard to love? in the family of God? Have you, ever, have you ever met some annoying people who are in God's family? How about people who are just aren't that nice? The truth is, we're family. And Peter says, you need to love each other like brothers and sisters in Christ because you will need them and they will need you, especially when we start to experience the hatred and the hostility that comes with being a follower of Jesus. You know, for a lot of people sitting in this room right now around us, this church family is all they have. This is family. They either don't have anyone in their family who are Christians or they don't have any living family members or if they have family members, they may be so estranged or they're so far apart or they live so far away, that this is family. You are family to people that are sitting all around you. And Peter says, if we're going to get through this life and we're going to face difficulty and suffering and persecution, we got to love each other like family. For many of us in church today, our church brothers and sisters are closer to us than our biological brothers and sisters. We have more relationship and more love with our brothers and sisters in Christ than we do with our very own family. And that's what we are to each other. Peter says, we're going to walk with God through difficult times. We got to stay close to other believers because we're all we got. Another reason to stay close to other believers is so that we can remain humble. Peter calls us in this list to have a tender heart and a humble mind. That's interesting to me. He's calling us to have that tender heart and a humble mind toward those who persecute us, towards those who hate us because of Jesus. And that's really hard to think about, isn't it? He's saying, don't turn your persecution into an excuse to be hateful or ugly or nasty, but be humble, be tender. Jesus was our ultimate example of this while hanging on the cross he looks up to heaven and he says, God, please forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. What I find interesting is that the instruction we're getting today to be tender and humble towards those who hate us is coming from the very man who was the first one to draw the sword and cut off the ears of those who came to arrest Jesus. And now, a few years after that, he's writing to you and me to be tender and humble evidence of the miraculous change that Jesus made in his life, I'm sure that as he watched Jesus suffer and be arrested, falsely arrested, and beaten and hung on a cross, and as he watched and listened to Jesus go through that, he was forever changed. And he calls us to stay humble 
and to be tender. So that's the first principle. Stay as close to other believers as you can, church, because we're going to need each other. The second principle is don't forget that revenge is not sweet. It never is. In verse 9, he says, Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. He's careful to make sure that you and I don't get caught up or caught in the undercurrents of anger and revenge on those who hate us. Because he knows that anger and revenge will take us down a lot quicker than any persecution in life will. Paul reminds us of this in Romans 12 when he says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So both Paul and Peter call us away from revenge and away from hate being, uh, just letting hate grow up in our hearts. Because the truth is God has no tolerance for those who harm his children. There will be no sparing of his justice and there will be no sparing of his wrath for those who persecute and hate his children. Look at the end of verse 12 real quick. Just at the end of that little verse, it says, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Solomon wrote in Proverbs 15, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. And so God sees the mistreatment. God sees the hatred. God sees the lies about you and the, and the deception of you, about you and the hatred toward you. He sees all of that, and he will not let one ounce of it go unaccounted for. And that's why Paul and Peter say, do not take revenge. That's God's job. Let him do his job. He will do it in perfect justice. And that's got to be what empowered Jesus not to call down from heaven 12 legions of angels when he's standing on trial from these sinful people who hate his guts as he's coming to die for their forgiveness why didn't Jesus just call down from heaven all the angels he had at his disposal to just wipe it all out? Could it be that he knows that God will not let one ounce of it go unaccounted for? I want you to turn back to chapter 2 and look at verse 23. Peter's already told us this, chapter 2, verse 23. When he was reviled, speaking of Jesus, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. And there are some of you in this room today where you are in a place where you must trust in the one who judges justly. Don't let hatred grow in your heart. Don't go down this revenge, this road of revenge. It will take you nowhere. It is not sweet, as our world likes to tell us. That's the second principle. Don't forget, revenge is not sweet. The third principle in our passage today is if we're going to walk with God through persecution then we need to bless those who hate the Jesus in us. This this is crazy sounding, I know, but look at the second half of verse 9. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called, that you may attain a blessing. Okay, all right, so we get the whole no revenge thing. You're probably thinking, all right, I could kind of hold back. You know, I won't, I won't seek revenge. But he goes way too far now when he says, I don't want you to get revenge, but I do want you to bless. I want you to bless those who hate you. I want you to bless those who hate you because you love Jesus. I want you to bless those who persecute you and harass you and reject you and make fun of you and mock you because of Jesus. Bless them. Okay, do you feel what I feel? There is nothing normal and natural about that request. There just isn't. Everything inside of the natural, the normal us, says that's crazy talk. How in the world do you expect us to bless those who treat us with such disdain because we love Jesus? Well, there's only one answer. We are not normal and natural anymore. We have been born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And the old us is gone. And the new us has the spirit of the living God in us. 
And through his example and through his power, we can do something that seems so unnatural and so abnormal in this human experience. Bless those who hate you. All right. Well, Peter just doesn't leave it there. He yanks a verse out of the Old Testament, Psalm 34, 12 through 16, and he inserts it into his letter to these persecuted Christians. And inside this, these verses, he gives us a picture of how we born-again believers are to bless people that persecute us. It sounds crazy, church, but it's what makes Christians and Christianity different from every other religion in the world. So what is it? How do we bless people? The first thing in this list would be this, speak kindly. He says, whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Peter says, here's how we're going to bless those who hate Jesus in us. Speak kindly to them. Speak kindly about them. Don't gossip. Don't slander them. Don't use nasty sarcasm or criticism when you're talking to them or about them. Because the truth is, our words that come out of our mouths always indicates what's in our hearts. And if we are full of venom and we spew that venom out every time we have encounter with or talk about the people who mistreat us, that venom only splashes all over our testimony of Jesus. And so he says, speak kindly. There's nothing normal about that but it is powerful as we cling to our faith in God and walk with him in persecution. Another thing, way we bless people is to pursue peace, relational peace. At the end of verse 11, he says, let, them, let him seek peace and pursue it. Remember, we're in the context of persecution or being in places that are hostile toward Jesus. Now, sometimes peace is impossible with those who hate us, but we don't want it to be because of us. To pursue peace means that we don't keep the conflict going. To pursue peace with those who hate the Jesus in us means we don't try to force Jesus into every single conversation because we know that nobody was ever won to Christ through a fight or through an argument. So he says, seek peace. Paul says, as far as it depends on you, live at peace. Don't you be the one that lets and causes the conflict to rage. Don't do that. Bless them by seeking peace. And then he tells us, here's how we bless them, do nice things. In verse 11a, the beginning, he says, let him turn away from evil and do good. Peter says, do good. We, we, we need to bless those who hate Jesus. So keep doing good. Keep doing the right thing. Instead of trying to make them miserable, or make them pay, do the exact opposite. Again, we turn to Romans chapter 12, and it says, to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. And in so doing, you will keep burning coals on his head. So do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Scripture's consistent. Peter's not on an island when he's telling us encouraging us to do good to those who persecute us. How, what in the world, how does that, what does that look like? I don't know. There may be a million different ways. I was trying to think this week. If you have a neighbor who just hates Jesus and knows you go to church and they just think you're an idiot and they let you know it, how do you do good in that situation? I don't know. Maybe it's bring their trash cans in on trash day when the trash is gone. It's just doing something good, something totally opposite. Maybe the coworker at work that, that gives you hassle all the time for being a Christian. Maybe it means buying them lunch. Maybe it means covering for them on a break. I, I don't know, but do something good. Maybe the family member who hates Jesus, or, you know, they just mock you for being a Christian who's coming over today for Father's Day lunch. Maybe doing good means to bless them with kind words. I want you to look at chapter 4, verse 19, one lone verse at the end of chapter 4. Peter writes, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Entrust our souls to our creator while we're doing good. 
Look at chapter 2, verse 15. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Doing good will silence and shut the mouths of the critics of Jesus more than trying to fight and go after them. Look at verse 12. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Do good. Do nice things. Here's another way we bless. Pray even more. Verse 12 is peculiar. He says, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. Now, think about this in the context of what Peter's writing. He's trying to give us hope and help in in clinging to God and remaining faithful, not giving up in the face of suffering and persecution. And so he tells us that God's ears are open to our prayers. If we choose to suffer with grace, our prayers seem to get to heaven a little quicker. Now, I wouldn't build my whole theology of prayer on that one half of verse, but what's clear is, as Peter is telling us, in the midst of our suffering for righteousness' sake, our prayers are are considered by God in a very special way. I was reading in Revelation this week and saw in Revelation chapter 5 as God is unfolding the picture of the final judgment in the end. And in this picture in Revelation chapter 5, the Lamb of God comes to to the throne to open the scroll, and as he's doing that, all these golden bowls filled with the prayers of the saints are brought to the altar. What an amazing thought that God not only hears the prayers, especially those of his children who are being persecuted, but he stores them in golden bowls and they will be brought to the altar of God as he unleashes his judgment and wrath upon the evil in the world. It's as if, as I read that, it's as if God is reminded of those prayers over the centuries of his saints who were persecuted and hated because of him. And he uses those prayers to ignite his passion and his wrath and his perfect justice on those who hate him. What an amazing sight Scripture gives. Another major principle now in this passage is this. Don't forget that righteous people will suffer. Now, this is key, folks, because Peter is so honest. He's not pulling any punches here. In fact, if you look at chapter 4, verse 12, it says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Peter's gonna go on to say, we'll get there in a few weeks, he's gonna go on to say, don't be surprised when you suffer. Don't let that shock you. Don't don't think it's strange. In verse 14 in our passage today, if you look, Actually, in verse 13, now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? He asks a rhetorical question. He says, listen, if you do good, people will treat you better. They'll treat you okay. But, he says, even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, he realizes even when we do good, we're still, we can still suffer. We're still going to be persecuted and hated sometimes. If you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. So have no fear and do not be troubled. Wow. In verse 9, we saw already that Peter says, if we bless, this is what we're called to do, that we will obtain a blessing. Now, look at verse 17. He says, for it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. So here we have it in three different verses. In verse 14, in verse 9, in verse 17, he says, listen, don't be surprised. It's going to happen, but you will be blessed. So what Peter is doing here is he's forming a strong theology of suffering, a foundational truth that sometimes the persecution we experience in this life is a part of God's plan and his purpose for his children. Let me say that again. What Peter is showing us here 
is that sometimes the persecution and hatred we experience in this life because we're Christians, sometimes that is the very part and plan of God for our lives. He's saying be, being persecuted should be something we should expect to experience, and more than that, we should expect it to be a blessing in our lives. Right about now, some of you are going, this is nuts. What happened? You're telling me to bless those who hate my guts, and now you're telling me God plans and purposes for my suffering so that I can be blessed? I know. Folks, this very principle, this just just dawned on me. I didn't say this to the other two services, so you're welcome for what I'm about to say. (laughs) It's divine principles of life like this that prove to me that Christianity is not a man-made religion. No man would make up a religion with this, would he? No! You don't make up a religion that says, hey, we're going to rejoice when life gets hard because it's going to be a blessing. Become a Christian. It's fun. No. This is supernatural wisdom and power from God. Paul agrees when he writes in 2 Timothy 3, he says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So the million-dollar reason is why. Why does God allow purpose for us to struggle and suffer and be hated and persecuted in this life? Why does he want that to be a part of our lives? Why could that possibly be his will? And the good news, church, is Scripture doesn't abandon us in the answer to that question. It gives us several reasons, several life preservers to cling to in trying to answer that question. Now, warning, I'm going to give you these answers, but I'm going to warn you that it's been my experience that when we're in the midst of suffering and trial and tribulation, we usually can't see the reason and purpose of God right away. Sometimes it's a long time afterwards. And I suppose even that in some of our suffering, we're not going to know the full purpose of God until we get to heaven. But we are promised that we will be blessed. And Scripture does not leave us without the answer. Let me give you some of those blessings before we go to lunch today. Number one, to test and increase the strength of our faith. Persecution and trials have a divine way of exposing what our faith is made out of. They force us to self-examine and realize whether or not our faith is more like spiritual quicksand or more like the rock upon which we stand. And the truth is, for a lot of us, church, when we go through struggle and trial and tribulation, the minute things go wrong or south or bad or hard, we sink, we quickly sink. Trials and tribulation have a way in God's provident, providential plan to show us our faith needs strengthening. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. Again, go back to chapter 1, verse 6. He says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, there's the providence of God in suffering, you have been grieved by various trials, verse 7, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's saying here, if necessary, our faith needs to be tried and tested as true. It will go through the fire of persecution and hatred and tribulation in order to purify our faith and make it stronger. That's what he's saying. James says, consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials because you know that the testing of your faith will produce perseverance or endurance or steadfastness, depending on the translation you're looking at. I can tell you, church, in my life, having gone through some very heart-wrenching trials, at times I have been saddened. I've been saddened and sobered to feel how quickly my heart has lost hope. It's been very humbling to see how fast I lost courage. And there were times in suffering where I found out, it became clear that my faith wasn't nearly as strong as I had hoped it was. And it forced me to reestablish in my heart the immovable, unchangeable faithfulness of God. 
And for that, I am so grateful. To test and increase the strength of our faith. Here's another blessing to humble us. Now, I know that doesn't sound so fun. Certainly doesn't fall into the category of blessing. But it can be. God's plan for his children may include being persecuted or suffering of different kinds of trials to remind us to not think too highly of ourselves. Romans again says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. The measure of true greatness is the measure of faith. How much faith we have in God. Paul applied this truth to himself in 2 Corinthians, and he said, There was given to me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Paul says, there was some, we think it's a person. We don't know what the thorn is, this messenger of Satan, but we think there was someone in Paul's life that was just making his life miserable with hatred. And Paul says, I'm pretty sure one of the purposes of that going on in my life was to keep me from exalting myself. And there are times, I believe, that God knows our hearts. He knows when we've gotten to that place where we are taking way too much credit for God's blessings and his grace in our lives. And when we get to that point, God has a way of bringing us back and bringing us closer to him so that we can rely on him more, so that we can be of more use to him for his kingdom work on this earth. If anybody is more susceptible to the need of being humbled, it's us pastors and elders and ministry leaders. The apostle Paul certainly was susceptible to it. He asked God to take away the thorn, and he gave us God's answer when he wrote in 2 Corinthians 12, God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, and I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities, for when I am weak, then I am strong. And Paul saw the providence of God and God's will in our suffering and persecution and being hated. He is saying, what God showed me was, I realized I can't get through this on my own. I need him, so I run to him, and I gladly say, you know what? I'm weak. God is my crutch. I'll lean on him all day long. I would rather do that and know his power in my life than try to Come up with my own reasons. He wants us to keep us, he wants to keep us humbly dependent on his strength for our lives. Here's another blessing to pull us away from materialistic love. It appears that God sends trials and persecution and suffering to rescue us from the inadequacy of material things to meet our deepest needs. Jesus said, No one can serve two masters, for he he, he will either Hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Suffering, church, persecution in our lives, trials in our lives have a way of showing us who or what we really love more than God. Hear me now. One of the purposes and blessings of difficult times in our lives is it starts to show who and what we are loving more than we are loving God. And have a way of making us realize that none of our stuff is really that important. See, our stuff can't solve our problems. Can't give us peace when we're anxious. Our stuff can't give us courage when we're scared. It can't give us hope when we're hopeless. Only God can do that. And so suffering has a way of helping us to reprioritize our life. To push aside anyone or anything that we have allowed to come between us and God. Here's another blessing to help us long for heaven. Persecution and evil and tribulations and tragedies all remind us that Jesus has come to save us and to give us eternal life. How will we be blessed if we walk with God through persecution? He will give us a vision and a longing for heaven that we desperately need. 2 Corinthians 4 says, we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. 
as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. The blessing of trial and tribulation in our life sometimes is a tremendous blessing because it reminds us that this is not our permanent address, that Jesus has come to save us from ourselves and from the evil in this world, and he has gone to prepare a place for us to be with him forever in heaven. And all of the pain and all of the tears and all of the sin and the hatred and the ugliness and the disease and the nastiness and betrayal and persecution, and you just add to that list all of the ugly, nasty hatred in our world of which we've seen more on the news in the last 36 hours than we could, we could care to stomach. He is reminding us every time we see it and feel it personally, we're on our way home. We are going home. And sometimes it takes some suffering to remember what he has saved us from. And I would say to you, if you're suffering today, one of the blessings may be the sheer reminder that there's going to come a day when this is all done. And it's all gone. And we're going to be in the very presence of our creator there are more blessings that we've run out of time for. I want to get you to lunch. I hope, that, uh, I hope that if anything this morning, you have begun to form in your heart a theology of how to walk with God in suffering and persecution. It can be done. And it, be, it can be done in a way when we stay close to other believers, when we don't fall prey to go down the road of revenge and hate, when we're committed to bless those who hate us, and we're not surprised and taken off guard, and we actually not only expect that we will suffer, but we will expect that it will bring blessing. That's how we can do it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I just pray for us as a church that these would be more than mere words on a Sunday morning, but God, that we would be able to live it out. God, we want to walk with you in the face of life's trials and suffering. God, we want to live in a way that is so powerful that we silence the critics of Jesus, that we display the goodness and glory that belong to you, and that, God, we actually live with peace and joy in a world that has no idea what either one of those truly is. So, God, we surrender to you now, even in the face of suffering, and ask, God, for your strength to carry on in your power. Amen. I want to say if, there are, if, if there's anyone in this room right now who has never surrendered your heart to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I pray that you will do that today. We have some people that are going to be right here as soon as we're dismissed that would love to talk to you about what it means to become a Christian and surrender your heart to him. And for, folks, if there are any of you going through some real suffering in your life right now, we would love to pray with you before you go home. That would be our honor. We would love to join with you and ask for God's strength in your life, all right? God bless you. Have a great rest of your Father's Day. We'll see you next Sunday.